We're going to begin this morning. Do me a favor, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 through 13. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. It was back in July, July 9th, for instance, uh, I had a very distinct dream, and I knew one day I would share it. I just didn't know it would be this weekend until Bob texted me. Um, today's message will be different than normal. If you've heard me speak in the past, this is definitely more of a prophetic edge and I, what I believe is a now word of God. Uh, it will be strange if you're not used to hearing dreams or things of that nature. Uh, but if, again, if you have theological questions, our elder team is more than happy to talk through those things. So just to give you a setup here, I'm going to read through an extended passage of Scripture, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Normally I would just read a couple verses. Um, so hang tight with that. Uh, then I'm going to share an odd example. You'll, you'll know exactly when I start it. Uh, but then hopefully it'll set the stage for us to really break open this passage. And then from there at the end, um, it was, I believe, Wednesday or Thursday, I met with my friend David, uh, David Leal, and he shared an incredible testimony. And I said, hey, man, you better be careful. Uh, I might have you share sometime soon. And the moment Bob texted me, I called him and said, hey, man, you're sharing with me this Sunday. Uh, so he's got an amazing testimony through Corona. Uh, but let's read this passage. I'm going to read it because it'll be very long for us to read together. Uh, but Matthew 25, 1 through 13, then we'll pray. It says this. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. It's the words of Jesus. Ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those brought their, uh, their lamps with their oil. And they got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him in the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore you know neither the day nor the hour. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your presence that's here. God, there are times we hear words of encouragement, but there are other days when you need us to hear a word of challenge. I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you prepare our hearts, that your gospel will be written in love in this very moment. God, I'm grateful for this church. I'm grateful for the testimonies that I've heard. As I walked in today, I saw the sign, mission isn't canceled. God, I'm grateful that your mission has continued on. Right now, as other churches gather live and both online, I ask, Holy Spirit, pour out your fire upon your church. Meet every church that's meeting right now, around the globe, that, God, we would see an outbreak of your spirit that could not be contained in buildings. God, we ask for the overturning of the coronavirus and all those that have been affected by it. We pray in the midst of this political climate, come, Holy Spirit. Bring justice as righteous judge. Bring peace in the midst of wickedness. God, we ask for the overturning of Roe v. Wade. God, we ask that you would establish righteous judges. We trust you. We had no political affiliation other than Jesus Christ as king. And we ask God, reign righteous in this moment. Show yourself strong as we enter into a season of fasting and prayer. Lord, we pray that we'd stand united with other churches, believing for you to move in a significant way. No matter who wins on November 3rd, you reign supreme. And we ask God that you would stand strong with us, encourage us, build us up. That those of either political party would know that this is a home church that could be a part of and experience love. But God, we ask for righteousness. We ask for peace. Bring your kingdom to be manifest among us. God, we pray for healing this morning. We would not need to wait for the end of a message for an altar call. But God, we ask right now that all pain would leave every body and those in attendance and watching online in Jesus' name. Any injury, any sickness, any discomfort, God, bring full restoration and healing right now. 
Again, for those online, we're sorry we can't pray for you specifically. We just ask that you engage with this moment. But right now, if you're here and you say, you know what, I need physical healing in my body, lift your hand up if that's you right now. We want you to identify with us. A couple there, a couple there. Anybody else? Lift your hand up high. Do me a favor, not to embarrass you. If you're comfortable, if you could stand, we want to pray for you right now and believe for an outpouring of God's healing on those in need. If you're able to stand, stand up. Church, extend your hands towards them. God, we pray right now for your healing to come and touch everybody that's in need. We pray for fibromyalgia. We command in the name of Jesus for it to go, that you would come and restore all to perfect physical health. Spinal injuries, discomfort. God, we say spines come into alignment in Jesus' name. Hips come into alignment in Jesus' name. Early on, said arthritis, we ask, Holy Spirit, you would come and take away all pain and inflammation, that God, you would do a work among us. The fire of the Holy Spirit would come and fill them, just even now, as they would feel, just fire, fill that part in the ankle. Right now, if somebody has an injury in the right ankle, God, we pray for healing to be restored. Diverticulitis, we pray in Jesus' name. Restore any inflammation in the intestine and throughout the stomach lining. You are able and you will answer. And we command in Jesus' name for healing, both presently and online. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, come on, get ready for something good. Wake up a little bit. Wave to that person. You guys are so well socially distanced. I see you. So proud of you. Oil is an interesting commodity. Oil fuels our houses. It fuels our cars. It fuels our factories. And as it's been around for millennia, crude oil in particular, we really haven't utilized it to its fullest until this last 100 years. In the late 1890s, we really saw this advent of the oil age begin. As they had technology to extract it from the ground, we recognized the rich oil soil that America had. But it really wasn't until 1901 where they call it the spindle top gusher was struck. Right outside of Lucas, Texas, these farmers were working on this oil field and they began to drill in the ground and this gusher erupted 150 feet high. So thick that it provided over 100,000 barrels of oil for seven straight days. This now created the oil age and we understood the richness of the soil now had the machinery to extract it from the ground. Well, right around that time, many tycoons in business started to gather around oil, and a lot of the industry was developed from that. In 2007, a strange movie was released. Some of you here may have seen it. This is by no means an endorsement of this movie, but just hang tight with this. It's a movie called There Will Be Blood. Has anybody seen There Will Be Blood? You sheepishly put your hand up there. There Will Be Blood is an art house film. It's incredibly long and arduous. It's three hours, it's hard to watch, and I'm not encouraging you to go home. I'm gonna spoil the ending, FYI. It's been out for 13 years, so don't get mad at me if I spoil it. But There Will Be Bloods about the story of a fictitious oil tycoon. They kind of drew the stories from various oil tycoons of the time. His name is Daniel Plainview. And what Daniel Plainview does is he has a, a young son that's adopted, and they begin to go around and, and develop their oil business, and they're striking deals and striking land. Well, he comes across a plot of land in a small church community. This small town, this small city, and as he go, goes around trying to buy plots of land around it, he recognizes that this small town preacher is the one that really runs the town. All the city government mayors kind of submit to him. Now, this preacher is not one like we would know. He really is a cult leader is the best way to explain it. And as he's there, Daniel recognizes in order for him to strike a deal for the land, he has to build a relationship with this preacher and begin going to his church. Well, again, we're talking cultic practices, strange expressions. This preacher makes a mockery of Daniel and in the end doesn't sell him the land. Well, as the movie goes on, an additional two hours, you see that Daniel becomes very wealthy. He loses all relationships. It's absolutely a tragedy. But at the end of the movie, he's in his mansion by himself. The preacher is now older, comes to him and says, Mr. Plainview, I recognize the success your company has had. I'm now interested in selling you my property. Daniel laughs in reply and says, your land is worthless. He says, I, I, I don't understand. He says, your land is worthless. 
I built derricks all around it and siphoned all the oil from your land. It's worth nothing. The preacher's in shock. And what becomes the line of the movie that many would quote? He says, I don't understand how you would do that. He says, pretend that you are holding a glass and within it is a milkshake. And I take a very long straw, shove it in your glass, and I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. Famous line, odd line, and like the movie promises, there's blood. I will not go into that. This is where the movie ends. I saw it in 07. Didn't think much of it. It then got rated the number one movie in the last 20 years by many film critics. I don't agree with that opinion. Haven't really thought much of it until July 9th of this year. I have a dream. I'm in a house. The church is in crisis, not The Rock, the capital C church. Persecution's broken out in America. And I'm with a few national leaders, a few that are friend of my, friends of mine. And one in particular is kind of leading the room. And as he's there, I, I, I feel the word of the Lord. I turn to him and say, I have the word of the Lord. I need to pray. He then says, now is not the time. I sit down on this couch. They're trying to figure out what to do. He says, Brandon, share your word. I get up. And I say verbatim. In 2007, there was a movie called There Will Be Blood. And I give the whole plot line of the movie. In this dream. To my surprise and shock, I haven't thought about this movie in 13 years, and in this dream, I recite the entire plot line. And I say at the end of this, just like Daniel Plainview, the devil has come to steal the oil of the church. He has come to steal the oil of the church, and like the ten bridesmaids, we must buy oil now. It's time for us to buy oil. We must buy oil now to be ready for what's ahead. And I wake up from the dream, shocked. I text my friends that were in the dream. One of them replies, there will be blood. That's my favorite movie. <laughs> he says, you won't believe it, but whenever my kids are at the table and they have a drink, I'll just shove a straw in and say, I drink your milkshake. <laughs> but I walked away from it really perplexed. Texted a friend, I said, do you have any messages that can explain the parable of the bridesmaids because it's a very odd parable. I have to be honest with you. All the parables in the New Testament are very difficult to understand, especially because we're several cultures removed from those parables. But this one's tough. And he said, hey, you know, I think I heard one message one time by a guy named Mike Bickle. I said, I know Mike Bickle. It's called the oil of intimacy. Thank you, YouTube. I found the oil of intimacy message. I begin to study and pray and, and really ask the Lord for, about his interpretation of this complex parable. So you see, for us, we really struggle with the mystery of revelation in the Bible. And for many of us, we've become accustomed to pre-processed revelation. We've become accustomed to words that are easy and not difficult to understand. You see, the disciples go to Jesus in Matthew 13 and they say, why is it that you speak in parables? He says, to you I've given the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But ever seeing, they do not see, and ever hearing, they do not hear, lest they turn and heal them. And people say, and a lot of reformers use that, well, that's why there's, you know, selective revelation. And it's like, no, that's not the point of this. We learn throughout the Gospels, Jesus is looking for those that will search for him in spirit and truth. He's looking for those that will wrestle with the revelation that he wants to reveal. That will wrestle with the parables. It says, I believe it's Proverbs 25, that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of a king to search it out. It's part of our king-priest responsibility to wrestle with the revelation of God. The parables are part of that, which does it. And we have to wrestle, we have to work. See, one of the greatest tragedies in our culture, and has had an effect on our health, is processed food. Everybody gets all quiet. I grew up in the 80s. I'm well accustomed to processed food. We become so used to drive throughs now DoorDash, that the pain and struggle of working with something we don't understand is foreign to us. And let me tell you this. We become accustomed to messages that are pre-processed, words that are easy. That's not the God we serve. I don't know about you, but have you ever had someone tell you the truth? It's not easy to receive, especially if you've been deceived. 
And the moment we recognize that culture is accepting the truth of God, we have to ask the question, if they're still living in deception, is it truly truth that's being preached? It's our responsibility to stand up and declare the goodness of God in the land of the living, to believe for his power to come and shine upon us. That's what we're believing for. And let me tell you this. As much as there's pre-processed preaching, there is no processed promises. The promises of God do not come pre-packaged. Jeremiah 29, 11 on a bumper sticker means nothing unless you have a relationship with him. That being said, we wrestle with these parables. I begin to wrestle with this parable of the bridesmaids and what it means. And in verse 1, as you read this, here's what we learn. Here's the brilliance of Jesus. He borrows wedding practices from multiple cultures. So what scholars wrestle with is they say, this is not a Jewish wedding. This is not how the setup goes. And what we learn for the brilliance of this parable is Jesus isn't making the wedding the main illustration of the parable. It's about the readiness of the bridesmaids. This is what this scholar says. The reason why he tells us from the outset that we cannot tell this just by looking at them. All ten have come to the wedding. All ten have their lamps aglow with expectation. All ten presumably have on their bridesmaid gowns. We would never guess from the appearance that half are wise and half are foolish. It's not the looks, the lamps, or the long dresses that sets apart the wise from the foolish. It is their readiness. And church, the Lord is saying, are you ready for what's coming ahead? When we read these passages, we think of the great and terrible day of the Lord when he shows up and splits the sky open. But we are in multiple end times, and right now we're in the middle of one. Whether this is the end of ends or not, we don't know. But I'll tell you what, that first century church, when they read the book of Revelation, they thought they were in the end. They, they found comfort in that word. Right now, as we recognize, there are many antichrists among us. Those that are against the God we serve and love. The fact that the Supreme Court justice is nominated and the main assault on her is her faith, that's a problem. If you've heard what is said, culture starts to reveal their hand in these moments. Psalm 2, the nations rage against them. But guess what? He's still king. And that's the God we serve in this moment. No matter who wins, I don't care. He reigns. That's all that matters in this moment. He is just. He is righteous. And he is good. So from this, we have these five foolish and five wise. But what separates them is the oil in their lamps. Now, the oil here is not crude oil. And what people wrestle with is they say, okay, these five wise and five foolish, obviously the wise are incredibly selfish. Why would they not share their oil? Now, I purchased a small oil lamp just to understand this. Don't have it with me this morning. I'll bring it another time. But these oil lamps are small. And what I found was this, the purpose of the bridesmaids in this custom is that the, the bridegroom was coming in a late hour and it was their responsibility to light the way of his coming. The reason they are there and they're virgins, they're set aside, they're undefiled is what this parable is explaining. Their job was to light the way of the king. And they say to them, we can't share our oil, otherwise our lamps will not burn. What we learn from this is this. Your oil of intimacy can't be shared with someone else. The oil of the Spirit of God that's within you, the anointing that God has for you, is not meant to be shared with another. It has to be cultivated in your own life with the Lord. That's the purpose. And when it comes time, they go to buy oil, but there's none for sale. And when they finally find some, the door is shut. And church, we're going to see a great falling away because it's not getting easier to serve God in this climate. I have my brother and sister here from China. It's not easy to be a Christian in that environment. But I'll tell you what, there's a cultural Christianity there that they would say, oh, it's easy to serve him. But guess what? It's a compromised church that doesn't believe that God's king. They don't believe that Jesus is God. The Bible that they read from on their Sunday morning that they can gather with in their public squares is not the Bible that we read. It's taken out all the deification of Jesus. 
You think, wow, that will never happen to America. Stay tuned, friends. When it comes down to it, when the hard times happen, will you have oil in your lamp to welcome the king in his return? Will we have a fire that burns? One commentary said, their flame grew dim. I know it's hard right now. I know it's difficult. I know we stand here and wonder, do I have what is needed in this season? We have a God that is an amazing, amazing king. He's an amazing, amazing provider, and his presence is with you always till the end of the age, he says. So as I begin to study this, Lord, what does it mean to have oil in the lamp? I found out something interesting. See, that most of the parables of Jesus are agricultural. They have what we call a fancy word, agrarian society. So they have these agricultural examples because they were a farming community. Here's what was fascinating. The two major examples of agriculture that Jesus uses throughout the New Testament are vines and olive trees. Why is this? Because every family or household, every oikos had an olive tree and a vineyard. So guess what? When he talks about pruning, they understood. And when he talked about pressing, they understood. The vineyards for pruning, the olive oils for pressing. Here's what's fascinating about the olive tree. Get this. It said this, as I studied this, the Jewish olive tree in particular, of Israel. They said, a wild olive tree versus a cultivated olive tree the wild olive tree doesn't produce the same fruit as the cultivated one that's inside of an oikos. And because the fruit's not as good, the oil is not as rich. Did you capture that? The wild tree that's left on its own, that's not cultivated by the vine dresser, that's not cultivated by the farmer, doesn't have the same oil output as the one that's cultivated in the community. Church, I understand that many believe they can have their own relationship with God outside of community, but guess what? It's not biblical, and you won't have the same outpouring of His Spirit in your life unless you're connected with others. You won't. I understand and to recognize there are seasons where you have to break away from a community because it's not healthy, or you feel that maybe a small season of church by yourself is appropriate, but you're not meant to be alone. We have to be cultivated. The oil of his presence has to be cultivated in community. Here's what they would do is they would take these olives and when harvest came, this is fascinating, they wouldn't go and pluck the olives. They would take a rod and beat the tree. They take a rod and beat the tree because the fruit that's ready falls. Have you guys ever eaten a fruit outside of, outside of its season? Awful. I love my neighbors. Hopefully they're not listening right now. But they often bring me oranges in an unpruned tree, and they're awful oranges. See, a tree has to be cultivated. It has to be cared for. And what God does is to release fruit in your life, he brings the rod. To release fruit in your life, he brings the rod and strikes the tree. And it's in his grace that he does this. So that the fruit that's not ready doesn't fall. Oftentimes we want it to be so easy, but guess what? Other fruit is sacrificed because it hasn't come to maturity yet. And what they would do is they take this rod, they beat the tree, they collect it, they put it on a stone. And the Jewish way of doing it is they would take their hands and crush the olive to break it and then bring the stone to crush it. And the maturity of the tree determined the quality of the oil. We believe in a multi-generational church. We believe those young and old have a quality and a youngness that they're called to bring here, but also the wisdom of age. You may be in your late 60s, 70s, or 80s. Your time with God and the church's mission is not done yet. The oil is good for pressing. It's rich, and we need it. And that's the beauty of the blend. Single vineyards, they're good, but there's a beauty in the blend. And that's what God's called us to be in this season, is a blend. But in order for the anointing oil to be released, the pressing has to happen. 
Let me tell you this. So many of us, we're in a crisis of purpose as a culture. A massive crisis of purpose. And I believe that if you just preach purpose without promise, you're left wanting. Because without the promises of God confirming that which we will be in the end, what do you tether purpose to? But when you have a promise and the pressing happens, you find purpose in the pressing. When you have the promise of God as an anchor, and the pressing happens, you find purpose in the pressing, because you know there will be an end, but in the process, anointing is released. And he's anointed us, church, for such a time as this. Isaiah 61 was not retired with Jesus on the cross in the grave. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. He's anointed you to preach good news, to baptize and set captives free. That's our call. Yeah. You want to know what your purpose is? Set some people free. Disciple them into the kingdom. Show them the way. I'm believing for an outpouring of God's spirit in this season that will make these next 90 days far greater and make this beginning half of 2020 look like it was worth it because of the outpouring that he had. I don't want 2020 to be the year that we will to an end. God's not done with this year. He's not done with this year, church. He's not finished being king. He doesn't stand in heaven with his day planner saying, guys, sorry, 90 more days. I'm out of ideas. I'm, I'm fresh out. Help me with this. We'll just, we'll just hold up till we can. I want to believe that we look back October to December and say 2020 was worth it for what God did. 2020 was worth it for provision, for healing, for his power. Let us believe that he will show up in a significant way. Job final verse here and then I'm gonna have David briefly share what time we have yeah right on time look at that right on time Job 23 8 through 10 if I go forward he's not there or backward I cannot perceive him on the left he hides and I cannot behold him I turn to the right but I can't see him but he knows the way I take and when he has tested me I shall come out like pure gold you may not see him, you may not feel him, you may not hear him, but he's with you and he's refining you, he's purifying you to reveal his glory within you and your family.